An emotional weekend at Spa at the Belgian Grand Prix, remembering Antoine Hubert, who lost his life in the Formula 2 race this time last year. I thought the remembrance of Antoine over the weekend, very tastefully done, nice logo designed. There was a very emotional, moving ceremony on the grid before the Formula 2 race and before the Formula 1 race too. So uh, yeah, that was very much in everyone's mind. Meanwhile, the racing, of course, did go on. Lirim Zindeli had a very good day and won his first big Formula 3 race. And what a day for Trident too. First for Lirim Zendeli, third for David Beckman, seventh for Ollie Caldwell. But that was not unrelated to Trident's position in the pit lane because they were right at the end of the pit lane just before that hairpin exit opposite the Williams Formula One uh, pit perch and that gave them a prime position to get out on the track early in those very very congested closing minutes of qualifying. The odd thing was that David Beckman then led the Trident team and therefore the entire field onto the track for those congested final moments of qualifying. Actually, it was the beginning of qualifying because it rained towards the end. That put paid to anybody doing a lap time towards the end of the, of the session. So it was critical to be out early. But then having got to the lead, he then let everybody go thinking, I've got to get a toe, I've got to get a toe. Whereas Lirim Zindeli, kind of the Lewis Hamilton philosophy of let's just get in a free good lap, not worry too much about getting a toe and the effect of other cars, got in a lap. It probably wouldn't have been a pole lap if it had been a full 30-minute session, but it was enough to get in the pole in those circumstances. Why Trident were there in that prime position right next to Williams, opposite Williams, is a question that nobody could answer over the weekend and because uh, it wasn't defined by which drivers are related to which Formula One teams because the two Williams drivers, and, and let's reiterate that Williams had the perfect position in the pit lane for both Formula Three and Formula Two where it's really, really congested and tight. The two drivers for that are Dan Tictum in Formula Two with Dams and Jack Aitken at Campos. And, and Campos was the other end of the pit lane. Dams are about in the middle. So it doesn't bear any relation to what the driver's affiliation is with any Formula One team, if any. So, um, yeah, well, there's somebody coming up in this show right now. I'm going to put that question to and he should know the answer. The Formula 2 feature race, meanwhile, absolutely brilliant. Carlens Yuki Sonoda versus High Tech's Nikita Mazepin, both young chargers in their own way. Mazepin crossed the line ahead but was given a five second penalty, what was considered to be unsafe driving at the Le Combe chicane. Personally, I didn't agree with that, and certainly Nikita didn't afterwards as he rammed into the P2 bollard in Parc Ferme and got a suspended penalty. There were other issues as well. There was a potential penalty for Mazepin during the race. They were going to investigate it afterwards for an unsafe release. Whereas in reality, it looked as if the Trident guys were standing a little bit too near the edge of the box. And all Mazepin did was just drive straight out and, the, and one of the Trident mechanics had to move back. So I, I, I feel uncomfortable when two very, very good racing drivers are really at it, really, really hard at it. And you know that one of them might be penalized after the race. I think on a circuit like Spa, particularly, it highlights the importance of either giving them a penalty there and then or not. Because what you don't want to do is be racing, perhaps having an accident, taking risks, and then find at the end of it, it wasn't worthwhile anyway, because you're going to get your five second penalty. I think we need to be looking at that. So anyway, it was a great race, great win for Carlin's Yuki Sonoda. And then on the Sunday, it was all prima, prima, prima. Logan Sargent had a bit of an engine problem in the feature Formula 3 race, but he made up for it on the Sunday. Fabulous win for Logan Sargent. Uh, and also a very good driver, Frederick Vesti, who we've had on this show as well, the other Prima driver. Bit of a difficult weekend for Oscar Piastri, but a great win for Logan Sargent, who is, as we've been saying for several years now, the American that potentially will be in Formula One sooner rather than later. And then in the Formula Two sprint race, it was Robert Schwartzman winning for Prima. Mick Schumacher was a little bit further back on the reverse grid because he had finished third in the feature race and he got a podium finish as well. So very, very good day for Prima. So to talk about all of that and to talk about F2 and F3 and to talk about motor racing in general. I caught up with Trevor Carlin uh, today, Tuesday after the Belgian Grand Prix, to talk about everything that happened over the weekend, how his season's gone so far. And don't forget, Trevor, of course, is also doing the IndyCar series and has been going pretty well there too. He got a poll recently with Connor Daly's. Uh, well, with the, well the, the last couple of months have been obviously just really busy because all, all our teams are now racing every weekend. You know, it's back to back, three or four teams out every weekend. Um, the way this season was scheduled uh, at the beginning of the year, things were spread out and uh, 
yeah, we had time to regroup and stuff. Um, the, the, the biggest issue was when the COVID lockdown started back in March, uh, none of us knew um, yeah, whether we'd ever actually go racing again this year at all. So, uh, yeah, we, in our minds, we set a target of if it's a three month delay, we could probably survive and get through the year. If it's six months, um, we'd, 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 yeah, we'd be struggling to be in business. And, and thank goodness to all the organisers of the championships around the world, you know, IndyCar, F1, F2, all these guys, um, they've managed to put a show on, which has kept us in business. So, uh, yeah, we, we, sitting here today, we consider ourselves very lucky. So let's talk a little bit about the Indy operation and how that, uh, how you made that work. And, and you've had some great results. I mean, you get the pole with, with, with Connor and, and, and some good results now with Max. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's been challenging because we've had to, because of COVID, we, we had a second driver lined up for this year. Um, he was a European driver, and of course, all of a sudden, he couldn't travel to the States. Um, he was going to miss the first half a dozen races, so his sponsor said, look, can we delay things until till 2021? So we're back to one car, which makes it very difficult. We, we, you know, we're getting, you know, getting half or a third of the data. Someone like Andretti getting five times the data we're getting. So I think we've done, we're probably having our best year ever. Um, and you know with 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 very little input so the, the guys at the team in america colin and the guys are doing an amazing job a brief um opinion from you on on the aero screen and how that's working uh I, I think it's from a safety point of view it's quite incredible i think the way indycar and delara adapted it and red bull technologies was brilliant um personally i think it's a bit ugly um and but I'm hoping you know in in, in the future when they make a, a new car they'll incorporate it better. The concept's brilliant, um, uh, but I just think it could be more aesthetically pleasing. And moving to to Europe, great win for Yuki Tsunoda at, at Spa. He's shown amazing pace all year. A few thoughts on on Yuki. He's he looks to be something very very special. Well, you know it, it's funny because it's it's exactly 12 months ago um, to this week that I had my first meeting with uh, Dr. Marco regarding Yuki. Um, and he said he wanted to talk to me about a Red Bull Junior coming to F2. I had no idea which one. Uh, and when he told me it was Yuki, I, I was truly excited because uh, I watched his racing last year in Formula, two, Formula 3. Um, and I was amazed at what he was managing to do. In a, you know, he's, he was driving with Genza, who's a great team, but they're a small team and they're limited on budget and finances. Um, and what Yuki was managing to do was extraordinary. And his racecraft was amazing kept attacking and um you know being a a team that are used to having attacking japanese people in our team you know, our foundation basically uh, it was it was a great opportunity and how's he running his life at the moment in terms of where he's living and how much time he spends at the shop and and how he how he how he works really well i mean pre pre i mean he's basically been in the uk the whole time um um, obviously couldn't go back to Japan because of quarantine, etc. Um, it, and bless him, he's, he has three months at home in a, in a flat in Milton Keynes on his own. Um, well, that can't be any fun for anybody, let alone a little Japanese kid. Um, so, um, but yeah, he did well. And then when, when lockdown eased, um, he was able to come to the factory and go on our sim and spend time with the, with the mechanics and engineers. And now, of course... Uh, now we're racing. I mean, he hasn't had any chance to do anything because it's three, three on, one off, three on, one off. Um, so he, he's flat out. He's with the team all the time, and we've gone to the extent of actually we've 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 put a simulator in our truck, so uh, Yuki and Gian can practice when they're because they've got so much in between time. They can practice when they're at the circuit. Key driver changes in Formula Three. You've got David Schumacher now. Some thoughts on that? Uh, well, it's, it's it's been to to be honest. we I'm chuffed to bits. Uh, um, obviously, I'm, a, I'm, I'm the world's biggest motorsport fan in the first place. Um, so, you know, um, Michael and Ralph are people that I've seen uh, when I was a kid. I mean, I remember seeing Ralph uh, in the Macau Grand Prix the year before he first raced there. He was out the back of the garage cleaning wheels, you know, with his, with his team just to get a feel for the place. So I've, yeah, I've known of Ralph for a long time and, and have David in the team. A Schumacher on the, name, the side of a Carlin car is a big thing. David's... Uh, He's, he's a lovely kid. Uh, he's you know he's young. Uh, he's very quiet. Uh, he's very measured, um, and he enjoyed his first weekend with us in Spa. He did a good job in free practice. Um, qualifying, as we all know, was a complete debacle. Um, harder for us because we're down the far end of the pit lane, so we're always at the back of the queue. Um, 
you know, hindsight, maybe we should have gone out late, but then then we might have got caught by the rain. So, um, you know, it's but, but David liked driving the car. We loved having him in the team. Um, it was really pretty cool. Um, and what we'd love to do is get him some great results in Monza and Mugello um, so he'd consider staying with us next season. How much of a racing dad is Ralph? Uh, he's, he's pretty cool, to be honest with you. He's, he's, he's obviously very knowledgeable, um, as, as he would be and as you'd expect. But um, he's, he's cool. He, he gets it. He understands it. Um, he asks the right questions and then he accepts an answer. And, and the, the thing about us at Carling... Um, is we don't we don't lie to people. We tell them the truth. If we made a mistake, we admit it. If we think the driver could do, do better, we we say that, um, and we try and work together as a team. We're not we're not a blame culture type company. Trevor, you mentioned the pit lane position. I think we just finished on that. How is that decided in terms of where the F3 and F2 teams are in the pit lane? Uh, it's a bit random, really. I mean, what what you had like back in the day, they had a situation where. Uh, a Formula 2 driver or a GB2 driver was affiliated to an F1 team. So it, it was very useful that the um, that driver was outside the F1 garage. Um, well, so it was sort of the teams are requested to, 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 to go outside a certain garage. And of course, you've got certain teams with certain links. So you've got Prima linked to Racing Point. So they're outside Racing Point. Um, you've got ART linked to uh, Sauber. So they're outside their garage. So that's how it is. Probably now the thing's getting so competitive, we should probably look at the, the way that system is and it should be done in championship order, I think. Uh, it's something I need to discuss. It's done at Sparks. I mean, to follow your logic there, either Campos or Dan should have been opposite Williams with Dan Tictimore or Jack Aitken, but they weren't. No, but then, no, but but then it's then it's a timing thing. Who requested it first, and then the Formula One team needs to agree with that request. So you know, it's uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's a bit, it's, it's a bit it's random. So critical in terms of getting a good qualifying lap, particularly the circuit like Spa, how narrow the pit lane is, and with the hairpin there, and yet it seems a bit wishy-washy in terms of how those positions are actually given. Yeah. Does seem- yeah, it, 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 it's, it's probably something that if, if we want to dot the I's and cross the T's, it's probably something that needs addressing. And the only way to do it fairly is based on championship position. Mm-hmm.